All right, let's do it. Ladies and gentlemen, joining me on the line. He wasn't supposed to be here this week, but, you know, things. Uh, Mike Reyes from CinemaBlend.com joining me a day late. Uh, Moose filled in for you this week. We talked Indiana Jones and DC News and had a nice little chat, but you actually went and saw Indiana Jones. Yes, I did, and, you know, it's always nice to see you and Moose reunite, so I just got to put that out there, uh, (laughs) folks. Clearly, there is a lot of love there and a lot of friendship, but yeah, I did. Uh, I did see Indiana Jones. Okay, yeah. real quick, real quick, real quick. Spoiler free is right now. We'll get to maybe some of the spoilers because I want to ask you about something. Uh, but spoiler free, oh, what do we think? Sure. I kind of want to go see it again because upon first watch, it I am very unimpressed. Really? I am very like I am really upset with how this did not do much for me. And it's like, I love James Mangold. I love his movies. I, I mean, I guess the first thing I can say is he is, I think the fourth credited writer on this movie with a pair that worked together. And then another writer coming in with an and credit. Uh, That's a fun way to pick out what sort of writing goes into a movie is if you see an ampersand between two names, they work together. If you see the word and spelt out, that means that person came in and worked independently, did some work. Oh, You've okay. got two of those and credits in there. <laughs> that's rough. <laughs> so yeah, what? Yeah, it's uh, and and it's the funny thing was I was watching a video the other day about Kingdom of the Crystal Skull and how that went through some the same sort of development hell where it's like so many different writers coming in and so many different concepts melded together into this one shambling film. All right, so. You know, going back to that, I always thought that it was a weird story to begin with. It wasn't dirty enough. I always thought it wasn't, like, it was too clean of a movie to be an Indiana Jones movie. Does that make sense? Which one? Uh, Crystal Skull. It did kind of feel very, yeah. Like, you... Partially, it's probably partially because it was just such a modernly made film. Yeah. But also, there was just a sweat and a a grime and a sort of worn nature in those films to the point where when I saw Jung- when Jungle Cruise came out the other year, they did a good job of mimicking that sort of look. Okay. Like there's certain scenes in there where it's like very much that sweaty sort of gleaming, shining quality to the image. So with this one, what was it? Was it the story? Was it the special effects? Was it the uh, acting? Because this is all stuff that came up the last time around. What was it this time that left you unimpressed? I honestly think it was the story two big decisions that i was like why did you do that when (laughs) the result was x and then it just there was something about it that just rang hollow like it didn't it it did not feel as exciting or thrilling as an indiana jones movie should okay i mean there's nothing wrong with the performances harrison ford is you know knocking it out of the park and he does some pretty good stuff with what he's given uh phoebe waller bridge i think is is fantastic as Helena and I some people have complained about her as like his companion for the journey I think she was a lot of fun Mads Mikkelsen I love him as a villain I feel like they did not give him a lot to really go by okay and he you know, again just not a false note on that man love that man to death but it's just like yeah we're bringing Nazis back and it's like there's not a real huge explanation as to why there's not a real, like, the, the, it, it's just sort of, it almost feels like shut up and play the hits. Okay. But, you know, there's there are some moments that genuinely got me to smile, and there's one towards the end that just was a beautiful callback to, to Raiders. I think I know what you're talking about. Uh, Mike Reyes from CinemaBlend.com on the line with me right now, doing a short one this week as you weren't even supposed to be here. Uh, just talking Indiana Jones. Uh, we're going to dive into a couple spoilers here because uh, obviously the plot is out on Wikipedia at this point. I read through it because I wasn't going to be able to see it before we talked about it. Um Boy, the, and so if you haven't seen it, you don't want to hear spoilers. Just turn this off now. I appreciate you showing up. Please subscribe. <laughs> but, um, boy, like and subscribe. Boy, you thought uh, aliens were gonna be weird, huh? <laughs> Dial of Destiny. I had no, I had no problem with that because again, this is something that has basis in archaeolo- archaeology. Yeah, and to be honest, in concept, sending. Indiana Jones back in time to ancient history feels like something you would do in a final adventure. 
Because for all this time, this man has chased the past and has studied it. And just to see him with that awe and with that reverence for being a part of it made sense. And I did. I I I just wish it was a better movie. Okay. But so he does still, time travel you know, I, in I, this. Yeah, yeah. And not only does he time travel, he goes straight back to uh to the time of Archimedes. Oh wow! And just it, it's it's this really cool sort of um, it's 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 kind of a fixed point in time where he basically they basically go back to the siege of Syracuse and you know, the, the, the Nazis think that they're going back to, to 39 because uh, Matt Mickelson's character is like, uh, Hitler's not doing the job. I'm going to go back and kill him, become the new Fuhrer and I'm going to do the job. Right. Oh, awesome. And then Indiana Jones. And then it's basically the same sort of thing you see with Indiana Jones movies. I have this great massive power. I'm going to use it to conquer the world. You don't really know what that does. I'm going to do it. I know what it does. You don't know what it does. I did it. Oh no! I didn't know what it did. Death. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. And to be honest, uh, seeing Nazis getting taken out by the Romans is is still pretty uh, <laughs> pretty fun. I like that. But <laughs> well, anytime you it, see Nazis it, it, getting just, mowed down, that's it's not a bad day. Oh wow! Do they get mowed down? And <laughs> well, that's another thing that was really interesting about this. There is there's a lot of collateral damage in this movie. And more so than any other, like, this is, like, probably the most cold-blooded movie when it comes to Indiana Jones, like, bystanders. Okay. Like, this one guy is just mowing people down in a college because they're trying to find Indy's notes. And then he's just, like, shooting people left and right. And it's like, wow, buddy. That's 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 pretty harsh. Wow. Uh, Mike Reyes from CinemaBlend.com on the line with me right now. Uh, was there any other last final thoughts about Indiana Jones? I don't know why they had to split Indy and Marion only to bring them back together at the end. They could have very easily just estranged them without papers because you see that he's been served divorce papers and it's like, wow, what happened there? And then you find out later that Shia LaBeouf's character is dead. Because yeah. Because he enlisted in Vietnam to piss off his father. Yeah, I saw, I read that. I didn't know he did it to piss off his father, but... Um, I read that. I'm like, wow, well, that's one way of getting uh, rid of that character. Yeah, it's like you, you want to get rid of that character, fine. But, I mean, I know, you were, I know you're, you're not going to invite Shia LaBeouf back, let's be honest. There's, he, he's going through some image problems and some personal problems. Yeah. So you're not, I know you're not going to invite him back, and he was a controversial character to begin with. But the whole point at the end of Indy 4 was my kid has the possibility to, you know, be a good egg and to turn over a new leaf. And then it's just kind of like, eh, but he despises his dad and runs off into war and dies. And it's like, uh, did, did you have to? Like you could have just, again, you could have either estranged them in some sort of way or just, you could have easily said, oh, he's on some sort of studying fellowship or I don't know. Just not that. I mean, I get what they're trying to do. They're trying to put in some more, emotional heft for Indy because it's the last ride. It's it's old man Indy, you know. I, yeah. I don't know how many more years I have of this. But you can do it better. All right. I, I had a thought, but I don't want to dive into it right now. I, Why not? Okay, the short of it is, it sounds like you just explained Star Trek Picard, and I know that it's always Star Trek with it, but everything you said just hey, happened at some point in the last three seasons of Star Trek Picard. I mean, that's not a bad co it's not a bad comparison and also it's it's another one of those big geek properties that people are going to be very very vo vocal in what happens there and whether they like it or not. I just I don't know why but there's just uh, it, it's like oh my god that's the same show. Anyways, uh Mike Reyes from cinemablend.com on the line with me right now as we wrap up with Indiana Jones. I promised him we'd only go about 10 minutes today. So uh, because he needs to get back to I work. I as long as you have to. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, work. Real, real quick. Uh, That's very true, though. Uh, we had another actor pass away yesterday. Alan Arkin uh, is dead at the age of 89. And uh, you might know him from... You, you would probably know him from a lot of movies because Alan Arkin was just a, a fantastic talent that uh, you would see him in movies like Little Miss Sunshine or Argo... Uh, the man has had a decades-long career and did everything from playing Inspector Clouseau 
in the movie Inspector Clouseau to, you know, he was a voice in Minions Rise of Gru last summer. Huh. Like, his his resume is as impressive as his performing prowess. And it, it, it just, it does kind of bum me out to just all of a sudden know that he's, he's no longer with us. It what what and I don't mean this in a bad way at all. He's one of those guys that you said his name and I didn't recognize. And when I saw his picture, I'm like, oh, I know who that is. That's partially because the man's career has gone on for so long, but also just because he was a chameleon. Yeah, like he he just really fit anywhere you put him. And you know, I one of the weirdest films I remember seeing him in was. There's this '80s sci-fi movie called Simon, and it's this guy that like these these I may be misremembering this at the time, but the scientists run a random experiment on this, just a guy they plucked out of obscurity, and they basically try to, like, reprogram him into thinking he's an alien. <laughs> and it's, just, it's, it's such a weird goofball movie, and it's, but it's one of those thinking, like, it's one of those high-concept goofball movies. Okay. Uh, no, he's a psycho- okay. So he's a psychology professor, and a group of scientists with an unlimited budget and a propensity for elaborate pranks uh, managed to convince him that he's of extraterrestrial origin. And there's all this stuff that happens as a result. And uh, this was something that was written and directed by Marshall Brickman, who worked with Woody Allen for a lot of his earlier movies. Oh wow! And you can kind of you get that sort of atmosphere and attitude in this movie. But not it's it's not a, a Woody Allen clone, but it's just there's very much you can tell that this was made by a collaborator of his because it's very it's smart, but it's also goofy. Okay. And like there's this whole scene where he's reliving like year like eons of of history, and he's like in a uh, sensory deprivation tank, and they just <laughs> keep cutting back, and you hear like different sorts of sound effects and music playing, and it's. I, I would highly recommend tracking that one down, as well as uh, he was great in a supporting role in Get Smart. He was uh, the movie. He was great in Argo, Edward Scissorhands, uh, Glengarry Glen Ross. Oh, Glengarry Glen Ross. Oh, boy. That's cool. Oof. I mean, just an amazing, amazing talent. All right. Well, Alan, we wish you nothing but the best and the great beyond. Mike Reyes from CinemaBlend.com joins me every week on the show to talk about movies. Kind of a bonus one this week, uh, as he was not supposed to be here, like we said. So, thank you, Mike. We appreciate it. Uh, like I said, I am. I hate miss. I hate missing out. So when you're like, "Hey, you want to do a quick couple of minutes?" It's like, "Yeah, yeah, I can do that." Just especially because we're heading into a holiday weekend. Yeah, people are going to want to know about Indy, and it's a I, kick in the I nuts like, when you're not here, you, man. Oh, with a steel-toed boot, I will tell you that much. But you know what, sir? <laughs> working with you, it, it's really sweet. Mike Reyes, have a great weekend. <laughs> you too, man.